classes in session. How you guys doing? Welcome to Unlearn 16 classes in session. And I am super honored to have the honorable Tony Clement back in my, well, my podcast room, but he's in his podcast room. Um, and today we're going to jump in and we're going to talk about some big sort of ideological issues. We're going to talk about democracy. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the trucker convoy and those protests and what that meant. We're not going to spend a lot of time on mandates and things like that, but democratically what that looked like, um, what should the limits be, if any. And then we're going to roll into obviously what's going on right now in Ukraine, what Canada's role has been thus far, what it should be, what should the international community be doing. So I'm incredibly excited to have you back. Thank you so much. No, thanks for the opportunity, Joanna. I, we, I love our, our chats. I know I, I tend to ramble with you, so I'll try to keep it reasonable <laughs> today. I can't. It's hard when you get somebody... Look, it's few and far in between that you get an intelligent individual. I know this sounds horribly uh, not humble, but an intelligent individual that we don't always see the same picture in the same way, but can have a good conversation. Sure. You know, I think it's really, really hard. So first, let's talk with the, we'll start with the trucker convoy. Again, sure. we're going to put mandates all over here. In your, you know, you spent a, obviously a very long time in both provincial and federal politics, in your opinion, that protest, not what it was about, because it, it shouldn't matter what the goal, it, it, I don't know if it should matter or what the protest, whether you agree or disagree with their goals, whether ending mandates or not ending mandates, but what do you think the parameters should be of peaceful protest in a democracy? Yeah, and that's such, such an important question. And uh, as I think you were alluding to, it shouldn't matter what the goal of the protest is. The rules should be the same for everybody who wishes to dissent. Mm -hmm. So let me start off by saying, I think that that particular protest went too far. It went on for far too long and it became, uh, it, 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 it started out as a protest and became a blockade. And so, you know, I think that there have to be lines drawn and they went over the line. And I think it was reasonable for law enforcement to be involved at some point. So you know, you I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said that at day one of the protest, but right. certainly after three weeks, I, I, I would agree with that. So there's the interesting question. What's the line? Is it a time amount? Is it the fact, like I joke all the time in my TikToks, is it the fact that they set up hot tubs? And like had childcare services that sort of showed a level of permanence to to their protest. Is it the fact that they the constant honking and noise? What where would you have drawn the line if you were yeah. you know? Yeah, I think the honking and the noise was a, mis a mistake on their part. I think that yeah. really galvanized the local residents against them. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, was just disturbing the peace, right? And, you know, sometimes, look, protests are going to be loud and noisy. We get that. Mm -hmm. They're going to have megaphones. They're going to have chanting. They're going to have, you know, people getting riled up. That's that's a normal protest. But honking your horn constantly at 3 a.m., that's, yeah. most Canadians consider that rather impolite at the at the very least. So, that's yeah, I, I don't I don't know what the, I don't know where the line exactly is. I can t I can tell you that uh, in my time in Ottawa, there was always lots of protests. Some of them were were for days and days. Like right. I think of the uh, I think of Idle No More uh, for uh, which was about Indigenous rights. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also think uh, people forget about the uh, the Occupy Wall Street. Pro yeah, protest. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, yeah, because they they did have an occupy in Ottawa too, and they right. took over a park uh, next to the Lord Elgin Hotel, and they were there for weeks and weeks. It was a, an encampment. Now it wasn't right in front of the Parliament, but it was still it was still there for a long time. So uh, I'm not sure. Obviously, when you're disturbing public peace, and when you've blocked off the main road in front of the Parliament building. Uh, I think at some point uh, that that does cross a line, but but I I think that you know obviously because this was such a political act, um, there were voices amongst us that didn't feel they had to write a right to be there at all. Mm 
And, right. and I would I would have to disagree with that. I think that even if you don't like what they're saying, uh, uh, oh, one other thing, uh, you know, whoever was using a symbol of hate amongst those people, whether it's a Nazi flag or a Confederate flag, that's uh, you know, I'm sorry, but that that's not acceptable uh, in our society. But right. uh, you know, let's assume for the sake of argument that not everybody on the protest was a Nazi, not everybody in the protest was a Confederate uh, right. in the U.S. Civil War. For obviously, such a weird flag. Like, what are you doing up here with that? <laughs> You're I don't know. I, I've never yeah. understood that. You know, well, I I understand the historical continuity of the Confederate flag, but that that's a flag. Well, the both flags are flags of losers. Uh, who uh, uh, inflicted a lot of pain on the world and, uh, right. and should be uh, assigned to historical uh, historical s- study, but re- and nothing else. Uh, but uh, anyway, aside from that, let's assume that there were legit people mm-hmm. who let, let, this this all started because the federal government was imposing a um, a, a vaccine mandate on truckers. Right. That's how this all started. I know it went from there and all these hangers on got involved and all these yeah. people with other ulterior motives got involved, but that was the essence of it to begin with. Mm-hmm. And then it did gain steam amongst the public. And I, I do have, you know, polling data that says this, that yeah. people, people who agreed that it was time for the federal government to end their mandates who right. disagree, you know, 80, 20 disagreed with the tactics of the trucking convoy. Uh, mm-hmm. But agreed with the main intention, which was, look, we got to move on from this. Co- you know, we, COVID is 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 with us. We've got to be as safe as possible. We can't keep shutting down society. Right. And so I think that that was a message that did deserve to be heard. Uh, but I'm with the 80 percent of Canadians who eventually disagreed with the way it was conveyed. Right. So, so really it wasn't the permanence that you necessarily object to. It was the, um, the implications for residents downtown Ottawa. It was the blockade to get to parliament because I know a lot of parliamentarians just didn't go to work because it was too dangerous. It was too risky and it was impeding upon, you know, actual functional government. Now, even though a lot of them were doing it over zoom or whatever at that point. Yeah. Um, no, I, just, I just think three weeks is, is a long time to shut down a main road in front of the parliament building in a G7 country. I, I just right. don't think that that's appropriate. It clearly did violate uh, the law and mm-hmm. that the police had a right to enforce the law. I, I do believe that they have a right to do that. And, and they did it in a, uh, let's face it, uh, I, th- I think the police activity when it occurred was was smart. It uh, did not uh, endanger anyone, uh, and it was done incrementally over a couple of days, and 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 it worked right. Listen, so I don't, yeah, I don't go to a lot of pro only for sheer fact. Where if you're in the middle of the protest, sometimes it goes sideways, and I like my job. So, which is a sad reality in a democracy, but nonetheless, that's a different debate. Um, but I mean, these were in. Incredibly nice police officers. I mean, they were giving them warning. They were giving them nice warning. They were putting flyers on their car. They were like, I have never seen such a lovely presentation of authority at any protest, to be honest with you. Like the way that they handled it, I think was, in, you know, incredible. Now, what about the Emergency Act? Yeah, well, that's the other, I was going to raise that. So that's the other side of the story. And um, I... I'm with all the commentators, including the international commentators, who felt that that was overkill. It -hmm. was not necessary. The police had the authorities they needed to deal with the protest without emergencies powers. Uh, They were broad powers. And uh, I don't think that the federal government made the case to parliament that uh, they were necessary in this instance. The the protests at the borders were already over by the time the Emergencies Act was invoked. Actually got him, yeah. So all it was about was the you know these ragtag truckers in in front of Parliament Hill, uh, and I just think it sets a dangerous precedent uh, when you're freezing bank accounts. Uh, that's the interesting thing too, because of course the War Measures Act was invoked by Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, right. fam- famously during the October crisis and the FLQ crisis in Quebec. Uh, 
Uh, and they arrest, they uh, 19, October 1970, they arrested a whole whack of people. Uh, no and, words, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, but this time, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, but I guess my point is this time they arrested fewer people, Mm -hmm. but you were in virtual jail when they froze your bank account. You can't do anything in our society now if you don't have online ability to pay your bills or to, you know, uh, to do whatever. And so uh, that's a very interesting thing that uh, we have to be. We have to be cognizant of the ability of the state, the government, to uh, ruin people's lives without ever putting them in jail. They can do that now. And so I, I just thought it was overkill and the, 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 the piece de resistance, I'd love to get your point of view on this, but the piece de resistance was, was the fact that before the, before the emergencies legislation even passed the Senate, they... Uh, revoke the legislation because <laughs> there was nothing left to do. Uh, yeah. And I just find the whole thing bizarre. And, and a lot of people, uh, a lot of the fellow travelers of Justin Trudeau, who, you know, Justin was used to them singing his praises in international fora, the Washington post, the New York times, all came uh, down. the salons of Europe, they all came down on his head pretty hard on that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So, I mean, a lot of people talk that the Senate wasn't going to pass it, which is why he pulled it, um, which would have been a very interesting thing to see play out. I don't know if that would have happened. Um, I guess I have two two things. Number one, jurisdictionally speaking, it's in Ottawa, and I and I don't I couldn't really find quite a, my answer when I when I tried to Google all of this, but jurisdictionally speaking, it's in Ottawa. It wasn't on Parliament Hill. It was on a street in Ottawa, which technically doesn't not make it an Ontario responsibility. Should And here's what I think Trudeau was up against. He was up against something that was disrupting the federal government, that was geared towards the federal government, but jurisdictionally was still Ontario. And let us it's all a game of politics. He didn't think for a minute Ford was going to rush to the defense of this and handle it on his own. Do you think maybe that played in? Um, I I think you can make a legal argument that it was still in the parliamentary precinct because there were buildings on the other side of the street that are still part of parliament, uh, including the prime minister's office is on the other side of the street. The Senate office building is on the other side of the street. Um, So I I think it's still the parliamentary precinct, quite frankly. Uh, And I, I, uh, Premier Ford did approve of the emergencies uh, in, yeah. invocation, uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know where uh, if you saw this, but it was quite interesting. During that period of protest, I happened to be around Queens Park a couple times, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the OPP were were tactically there. I mean, they were oh, yeah. they were on University Avenue. They were every. <laughs> point of access to the Ontario legislature yeah. building was covered for days on end. Yeah. So they were ready to, to prevent what had happened in Ottawa happening yeah. in Toronto, which I found very interesting. It was, it was like, I, my mom, unfortunately, we, we take a lot of trips down to hospital row there. And I'm just, I was astounded at how perfectly everybody's like, it's coming to Toronto. It's coming to Toronto. I'm like, you know what? It's not coming to Toronto. You know where they can go? They can go to Gerard, east of Coxwell. That's about yeah. where they can go right now. There's no, they're not getting yeah. anywhere important in Toronto. I promise you. Um, but the more that I, so, so when I saw him pass the Emergencies Act, right? I, you know, it is kind of funny, a little bit of a lack of education. I didn't realize that the War Measures Act had been changed, had been reallocated and changed to the Emergencies Act. So I had to go look up those specific changes. And then I, you know, I was drawn back to the Trudeau days and and I would expect most constitutional experts today, where would they fall on Trudeau Sr. and the War Measures Act? Would they say every right to do it or would they say absolutely not, he breached the Constitution? Ah, that's a really good question. I think that, uh, I think that, Certainly, the public was with Trudeau. 
mm-hmm. when he did that yes, when he were. did that in yes. 1970. Uh, and let's not forget for for your uh, listeners and viewers who don't remember all the details of October 1970. And they might actually we might want to give it a bit more context because I have a lot of American listeners. Yeah, as well. sure. So. They so there was the Front de Libération de Québec, which was a uh, a separatist group in Quebec that was using terrorism tactics uh, to uh, assert their political point of view. So it's the classical definition of terrorism. Uh, and so there were a bunch of letter bombs that, that they would they would put bombs in letter boxes. Uh, there was a kid who died when, when one of the bombs exploded. Right. And there were two major kidnappings of political figures. One was Pierre Laporte, who was the Minister of Labor and Deputy Premier of Quebec. He was eventually assassinated by the FLQ. He he turned up dead. They also kidnapped the um, the British High Commissioner James Cross, uh, obviously a, a diplomat. And so this was real. I mean, the, you know, you talk about theoretical terrorism. This was real terrorism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Trudeau invoked martial law. That's basically what it is, the the War Measures Act. Uh, There was a curfew. There were mass arrests of political figures who had expressed a uh, sympathy to Mm -hmm. separatism, to Quebec being an independent country. Many of them were artists. I think of Pauline Julien or Gilles Vigneault, the, right. these, the, the artist class in Quebec that was uh, very indépendantiste. Uh, and uh, so that, and that's the thing that has sort of gotten over time a lot more play is, is how broad the arrests were, probably oh, yeah. o- overly broad. Um, but at the time, it was, uh, there was, a, I remember the fear even in even in I was in Hamilton as a kid when this was going on, and uh, there was a fear. I mean, people were rattled by this sort of separatist violence happening in 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 Quebec. So uh, I think that what happened after that was there was a review of the legislation, the actions of government. They felt there had to be more um, oversight. If yes. you're going to use the extraordinary powers, which which what the Emergencies Act has, I think that the Emergencies Act legislation uh, was changed from the War Measures Act in 1988. So it was actually done by a conservative government, the Mulroney Already, government. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, and so I think generally it's a better piece of legislation, more modern, uh, more oversight, more accountability. If you're going to use it, it, it really should be uh, a last resort situation, which is part of the criticism that Justin Trudeau is facing, that it really wasn't seen as a last resort situation. Do you think that maybe, and again, I mean, to be honest, if I was going to judge this whole situation, I would judge it as a lack of leadership, not necessarily the wrong plays. And, And the reason why I say that, you know, a lot of people will think that just because I don't necessarily ally with the truckers, that I'm automatically on Trudeau's side. I think it was incredibly poor leadership. There wasn't a lot of um, statements and politicization coming from Trudeau himself. Whereas Pierre Trudeau, who is his father, was front and center that whole thing. I'm going to take it on my shoulders. Oh, and you could you could love him or hate him. And that's usually how <laughs> Canada went. But I'm going to take it on my shoulders. Here's why we're doing it. Here's how we're doing it. You don't believe me? Just watch me. I mean, a very famous right. speech. Right. Whereas Trudeau Jr. Sorry. Justin Trudeau, sort of receded into the background of that. And I think that it felt like an absence of leadership with all of these harsh measures being then put upon. I also think when I think about the money, because everybody talks about the freezing of the accounts, because initially, because this isn't how it played out, but initially it was thought there was a lot of foreign money right? There was a lot of money coming from the US funneling into here through things like GoFundMes and things like that. And it was through the Wexit party of Alberta. And it was all this hyper politicization of what was actually going on here. And I think at times it almost, a coup is a very strong word, but it felt at times like they were going to sit there until he resigned. And in a, demo, you know what I mean? Like, no, there's no, he's storming the castle, but they were going to sit there until he resigned. And there was going to be this onslaught of money coming towards them to enable to do so. And then I started thinking, wow, what a, 
fascinating challenge to democracy in a country, and this is happening everywhere, because it didn't it didn't pan out that way. So let me stipulate that all right. of the proof that, you should you should mention that, that about ninety percent of the money actually was domestically was raised. Yeah, absolutely. But when when nobody knew, and that was all sort of sort of heightened, a lot of my thoughts were. Wow, because a lot of this has come up about a whole bunch of different political movements, because heaven knows we do this other places. Um, how much money you can infuse into a system before you are purposefully, you know, creating a lack of democracy in that system to make decisions for itself because of the money you can push into it. Right. And I find that concept fascinating. Everybody who's talking about, we have to fight the world economic form. We have to fight globalization. We have to, you know, all of these supranational things shouldn't be, shouldn't exist. And I'm like, yeah, but they do. They already do exist. Like we're not fighting about whether they should, they do. So let's embrace that. You know, billionaires do exist and they do have connections and they do have politically charged motives in order to see certain things happen in certain places. And what a, because we're going to roll right into Ukraine in a second and yeah, I think yeah. it's going way, right? There's, there's a, I, you know, uh, I, this may surprise you about how much I agree with you, but I, I do. I, I, and I obviously uh, billionaires and money has a lot of play sure. in our political system. And uh, I, I do think that um, it always surprises me uh, how people are, it, because that's the status quo, quo, how people are willing to abide by the status quo, which clearly doesn't work in their favor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, a system that has so, so much money and mm -hmm. all this influence of these uh, global organizations, let's say, uh, I don't know. I, I, I wonder why you would, I think that there's, here's my observation. There's a lot of people that protect the global elites because they actually think they're part of the global elite, but they're not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Like Delusions a, of grandeur. any Canadian who actually thinks they're part of the global elite is really not part of the global elite because Fair. it's so much bigger and more powerful than anything mm -hmm. from Canada. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But 100%. that's that's how some people are. So yes, I mean, all of that was floating around, and uh, you know, I, I think part of it is the desire by some, or maybe it's just the, their reflex. They thought this was another January 6th, that, that these people mm. were going to storm yeah. the parliament building. They yeah. weren't going to storm the parliament building. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they wanted to change the government. Yeah. Well, people protest in front of parliament Hill. Most of them want to change the government. Sure. You know, uh, I mean, but they're not, there was no capability of doing that by force. Mm -hmm. And there were some idiots in that protest umbrella that probably and I think did uh, yeah. uh, enunciate that, but it's, it really wasn't serious. Uh, and um, I think that um, it was just a desire to conflate that with uh, January 6th on Capitol Hill that mm -hmm. kind of drove that narrative. And I don't think that was a fair narrative. And it certainly didn't reflect the, uh, the majority of people in Canada who had sympathy for part of the message of the, of the protest, which was, right. please, let's move on get our restrictions out of the way like they're doing in the US, like they're doing in the UK, like they're doing everywhere else in the world. Why are we so far behind? I think that's that's the part of it that ha I had some sympathy with. Uh, but in terms of democracy, it really was not a threat to our democracy uh, in my in my estimation, uh, any more so than any other protest, uh, a long or large protest that we've had on Parliament Hill over the years, uh, which I think is natural. And you've got to have those they're they're unpleasant for the government, and I take your point that Trudeau kind of hid from this protest and was not front I felt center. Like, maybe I'm wrong. Where I don't the heck know. was he? Yeah, yeah, Where, I it, felt like. Yeah. yeah, and I think that was a, a bad move on his part. Um, but uh, I think that generally, uh, you know, you got to take your lumps when you're in government. There's going to be people that are not going to like what you're doing, and they're going to protest it. And that's that's the the beauty of our democracy that you can do that. And I, I think it raised such cool, I, I did a podcast a few ago talking about sort of the full picture of democracy. A lot of people, when they talk about democracy, they just think of elections and it's just such a, 
such a sliver, right? Yes. And and I had a lot of people coming up to me or through whatever social media saying things like, well, Joanna, the, the government shouldn't ignore this and therefore things should change. And I'm like, okay, but let's let's just slow it down for a second. Let's assume 50,000 people were on parliament's doorstep. That I don't know how many, but I let's- I think that's high. That's high, but anyway, go on. Let's yeah. give them 50, okay? okay. So 50,000 people want the mandates to end tomorrow. That demand- is still not reflective of a democratic country because there's 36 or 37 million Canadians out there. So until you figure out what the 37 million want, that 50,000, just because they're heightened and they're willing to sit in their trunk and honk, truck and honk on their horn, just because they're more active particip- participants in that moment, doesn't give them any more power than the 37 million that didn't decide to protest or counter protest for that matter. Right, right. Um, And I think that's also interesting, right? Just because you're really loud (laughs) and there's a lot of, and there was a lot, doesn't mean you have more power because my, my end result was, listen, whether I agree or disagree, they made their statement. I think it's going to have impact, let it have impact, but you don't have to have impact while still sitting in your truck in the hot tub, doing whatever it is you're doing that now let it have the impact. Right. Um, but then Ukraine, right? Then All of a Ukraine, sudden, yeah. Then Ukraine. And I think it just knocked, everybody was here talking about freedom and everybody's misusing the word, in my opinion. I can barely hear the word freedom anymore without getting agitated because everybody was talking about freedom and what these mandates, you know, mask is taking away from my freedom. I'm like, okay, this is a lot. And then we get this horrific <laughs> example of what, taking away freedom looks like. And I think we also get this very unfortunate but connective example of what it's like when we involve ourselves, because everybody has, in other countries' foreign policy, how our money gets involved, how our weaponry gets involved, and all of a sudden, here we are. So maybe give your, I don't know, give your synopsis or give your seven cents on. Yeah. On- yeah. I, I do, I get my back up a little bit when there's a conflating of, well, you know, all these people who uh, were saying that, that this protest is about freedom should hang their heads in shame because you look at, look at the real freedom issue uh, right. in, in, in Ukraine. And, and I, I think that is a little bit of apples and oranges. Uh, and okay. yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think that you've got to give people the right to define freedom in Canada in a way. Uh, it's not enough to say because we have more freedom than Russian occupied Ukraine, we should shut up. I, I just, sorry, don't buy 100%, that. hundred percent. That's fair. A hundred percent. But I yeah. also, but I also have a problem with people putting a mask over their faces, saying, comparing themselves, and again, because it went the other way, right? That's why yeah, those yeah. lovely flags were being thrown around, comparing themselves to Auschwitz. So no, no, that's, that's completely I get, inappropriate. I get, the, I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very inappropriate. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think there is a, uh, I can't remember the phraseology, but there's a point that, uh, whoever uses Hitler first in an argument automatically loses the argument. Lose. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a good framework. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, but, uh, so Ukraine, yes. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Joanna, because obviously there's a lot going on uh, just ap- apart from the military aspect of it. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, let's let's just tackle one at a time. First of all, there's yeah. there are those who are self-blaming that are blaming that this ne- never would have happened if NATO hadn't expanded and that Putin okay. would. Putin was reacting to the expansion of NATO closer and closer and closer to his borders. Therefore, his reaction was predictable, and it's all laid at the feet of NATO. Well, let me I'm explain sorry. that. Let me explain that. Just it's sure, not sure. everybody gets NATO. You know what I mean? Like not everybody. So, just to give a five-second history lesson, you have the Cold War. You have, and I'm going to very simplify. I'm going to simplify this. You have two teams. You have the Warsaw Pact on one side. You have NATO on the other side. Everybody 
chooses their team <laughs> and we sit well, in Well, they the don't pool. choose it. When Warsaw Pact, they didn't get to choose. That's that's the well, major difference. Okay, fine. Soviets told them. So you have these two alliances, basically, right? And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact obviously collapses. And NATO does something very interesting. And I do like to point to this. NATO, because I just thereafter is when I was in university and NATO rebrands itself. So originally it was there to fight communism, protect democratic capitalist nations, right? And then there was no communism like or, or no Soviet Union anyways. And they rebrand themselves to be, for the most part, an anti-terrorist kind of entity. Right. Well, they were searching for a new mission. Yes. Sure. Which I remember when that happened, like I said, I was in university at the time and I was in IR. And I remember thinking, well, that's an interesting just downshift or upshift. I'm not even sure which that's really going to change the nature of what they're allowed to get involved in, what they think is their purview um, and how much power they're going to try to expand. So how many countries were in NATO, let's say 1991? Do you know? Because I don't I should have looked this up. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm going to say uh, a dozen or 15 Right. That's my, yeah, I think it was about that. I think it was about 15. And, and what about today? Well, it's probably expanded by about another 10. 27. Yeah. I thought yeah. around then. So with from 91 to 2019, let's say there's another 10 countries included in that. And a lot of them are shifting closer and closer to Russia's border. So right. why would Putin and, and Russia, if they're not communist anymore, if they no longer have that that side why why are they so uh, terrified annoyed whatever word you want to use of that expansion yeah so so uh you have to under and i i used to work in in russia actually uh 30 30 years ago um the 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 loss of empire what it, it is a thing it is a thing. Yeah. It's, it's it's not just made up. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Russians uh, were humiliated by the fact that these bits of their empire wanted to get the hell away from them, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so there. And Putin knows that. And uh, he made a very famous speech in Munich about fifteen years ago, where he said, uh, where yeah. he said the he said the greatest tragedy of the twentieth century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, that's saying a lot, because there's been a lot that's- of tragedy in the 20th century. But according to Putin- Who was president then? Who was prime minister then? Of, of which? Uh, who was prime minister of Canada? Who was president of the United States at that during 15 years ago? 15 years ago, so- I'm just trying to think of what the reaction would have been to that, because you think it should have been pretty heightened. Yeah, so it was. I guess it was a Chrétien, and it was- uh, uh, it was Bush? W, w. Bush. Yeah. 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 So this was at the Munich security conference. Putin showed up there and said, you know, this is, this is the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. I'm going to do something about it. And everybody goes, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, you don't have the power or the authority to do anything about it. So we don't care. Uh, but of course he, everything he's done since then has been to try to accrete, uh, to gain, a little bit of Georgia, a little bit of Moldova, a little bit of Donbass in Ukraine, Crimea. These are all little bits that he has reassembled. Belarus, uh, you know, getting uh, getting control of Belarus, which is what he has de facto control. So it's it's all part of regaining some lost bits of the empire. Uh, and and. Uh, so I get the argument is, well, that never would have happened and if we hadn't expanded NATO to right. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Poland, and the Baltic states were, and the Baltic states were actually in the Soviet Union. Those other countries were part right. of the Warsaw Pact, but, but they were nominally independent. But the Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia were in fact in the USSR. They are now part of NATO. Uh, I don't buy that. I I, I think, you know, I I think all of this stuff, you know, uh, Putin saying, well, you know, I had to invade because I had to make sure that uh, Ukraine did not go into NATO. Right. Right. No. Is that, you, that's is that the, that's that, the justification that, at this point. That's a lie. It's a lie. It's yeah, a, another it's one a of Putin's lies. Yeah. Uh, he actually doesn't think Ukraine is a country. 
He don't. Right. He doesn't think Ukrainians are a separate cultural entity. They are just misguided Russians. Mm-hmm. So all of this stuff about NATO, and if we'd only stopped and hadn't added these countries to NATO or allowed them to be part of NATO, he would just go away. It's a lie. It's it's not it's not true. He is a, an aggressive expansionist, and he's a liar, uh, and he's a brutal authoritarian. And so he is doing what he will do until he comes up against uh, a force that is equal to or stronger than himself. Hundred percent. And who does it's so truth. funny? We we talk about these things and we say, then he took a little bit of this, and then he took a little bit of this. And I know we just said we're not going to bring Hitler into anything, but who it's it's like it's like unfortunately he's a more intelligent Hitler in the sense that he's not going to do it all in once, right? No. He's not going to he's not going to have these big pushes. He's gonna he's gonna bite off a chunk. He's gonna wait a few years. He's gonna bite off another chunk, and he's gonna wait. And and that kind of and the policy of appeasement, because I do think this is why it's happening. The policy of appeasement on our side of the fence, and I and I mean NATO, and I mean Canada, I mean the Western world has allowed it to go on. And that's why I worry about where we're at, because you you let him take Crimea. And I do say let him take Crimea. Yeah, yeah. And nothing happened. Nothing and happened. And all he did was showed a totalitarian dictator that he could take a bigger chunk. And that's just proving to him what he can do next time. Right, And right. somebody said, you know, he can't just lose. Putin can't just lose. He, he can't just organize a peace agreement. Putin needs to know he lost. And it kind of goes along with what you said. It's like he needs to come up against that force. So what what would you, I'm going to give you all the power right now. What would your next step be if you're sitting in, you know, that magical, you know, whatever, with all those billionaires we talked about? What would right. be, <laughs> what well, would be your move? Well, well uh, the, uh, World War III is bad for business. Uh, okay. as well as bad nobody for humanity. Wants yeah. Nobody wants nobody that. Wants that. Uh, and and uh, so I think that uh, you have to know what the red lines are. And um, unfortunately, and I, if, I were, if I were the president of Ukraine, I'd be saying exactly as he is saying, you know, you've got to enforce a no-fly zone. You've got to give, give us more troops. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. This war is going to become your war anyway. anyway. Sure, I would say that if I were the president of Ukraine. But- right. He's not a member of NATO. Right. Okay? You know, yep. Na- NATO rules don't apply to Ukraine. Uh, right. As much as Ukrainians would like it to apply, they don't. Okay. It's not a member of NATO. There is something called Article 5 of NATO, which says an attack on one is an attack on all. Therefore, if you attack one of us, you get, you're going to get all of NATO uh, down your throat. That doesn't mm-hmm. apply to Ukraine. Putin knows that. Biden knows that. Kalensky knows that. They all know it. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't blame him for asking for more assistance uh, and a no-fly zone. But it's the the problem with a no-fly zone is you not only have to declare it, you have to enforce it. So we're going to have... have, We're going to have NATO planes and Ukrainian airspace shooting down Russian missiles and Russian uh, uh, planes? No. No, actually, we're not. We're not going to do that because that is World War III. So, uh, so, uh, I think there's an, there is, a, there is a limit to what we can do. We, I, I think, look, we're, we're, we are getting arms to the Ukrainians so they can, they can fight their fight and that will continue. And I believe that there's a whole lot more going on behind the scenes that we're not even privy to that the security forces and the militaries are sharing information about where the Russian targets are. Uh, they're assisting in the in the air defense of Ukraine, which has held up relatively well, even though they've got these hypersonic bombs now. Uh, and and so there's a lot going on, I think, under the surface that is helping Ukraine. But there is a limit to what we can do uh, without having a wider conflagration. The the second he incurs into Polish territory or the Baltic territory, different story. Uh, you know we have to we have to fight if that happens because they, those are NATO countries and we have to live up to our uh, our promises. But uh, absent that, uh, it's going to be a fight here. Now, now, what's the most likely result? Well, I guess there's one of three results: the Russians could go home, not likely to happen. The Russians could roll into Kiev, 
not in my view now, not likely to happen anytime soon. Uh, we we have, I think, the start of what is called a frozen conflict, where the Russian troops stay in place. They make incremental gains here. They lose a little bit of ground there. The uh, uh, civ- civilian car- casualties will be very high, but they they do not have de facto control over Ukrainian territory. And I think that's that could last for months. I don't know. I don't know when the logical conclusion of that is. Um, but uh, Putin, uh, you're right. Uh, Putin isn't going to just sort of say, "Well, I kind of made a mistake. I guess I'll go home now." He's not. He's not sure. going to do that. And uh, uh, he 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 feels that uh, the Russians are with him. And he feels that uh, he he's yeah. he's got to have a win here. Now, what ultimately they're paying a huge price. I mean, the, Russia is a pariah state. Uh, countries that had gotten their energy from Russia are rapidly not getting their energy from Russia. Uh, there, there are 250 corporations that have suspended operations in Russia, which is something that I did not expect to see happening, but it has happened yeah. very, very quickly. It's yeah. basically a new iron curtain, but it's a different iron curtain from the 1950s because the iron curtain then included so Poland, close. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, you know, yeah. it, all those countries are on the other side of the iron curtain this time around, uh, which is very, very different. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's my assessment of the situation. So I have a couple of questions. Number one, there have been cases where the United States and I, and or NATO have stepped into non-NATO. So I'm thinking about the United States goes into Iraq to protect Kuwait. Right. Right. None of their business. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to put, I don't need to fight about Iraq today, but I mean, not not their purview, but they decided here's because here's my issue standing behind the it's not in the NATO rules kind of camp. I get frustrated because we can then look back to the former Yugoslavia and we can look to Kuwait and we can sure. look to different things that have happened in those different countries where we did, in essence, you know, chuck those rules out or find a, an end around or whatever it is they did in order to to allow for that to happen. And because what the real issue, I think, isn't NATO's rules, it's the secondary thing you said, which is nobody wants to step into World War III. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I have to think back to Iraq, but uh, certainly France did not participate in Iraq, and they were a NATO country at the time. No. Uh, yeah, and, well, uh, you guys remember Iraq is the one that vetoed, um, would vetoed UN, because Iraq... Uh, sorry, France vetoed the UN because they were have they had good relationships with Saddam. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't not sure how much of a NATO operation it, it was, although it did involve some NATO affiliated countries. Uh, but the, I think ultimately you're right. The big difference is Iraq wasn't armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. That's right. the, that's the difference. So uh, in that well, there, sense, there's a different conversation now, yeah, right? I'm just, I think a lot of people are super tough because I remember when this whole thing started. Now it's very naive of me, I know, and very like whatever, but I'm like, oh, he lined up 150,000 soldiers. Great. Somebody get me 300,000 soldiers and line them at the other border and we'll wait. We'll just wait because that was my definitely after Crimea. I thought that was the best way. I thought line them up right now. Because I think everything else is about what to avoid, and it and it's really starting to feel very, uh, like very Cuban Missile Crisis. Who's going to turn their ship around, <laughs> right? Who's going to blink first? And and we're already in it. I I think we're already in it. I yeah, just think I mean, we even put enough players on the board. I, you know, I I guess that's a question of uh, the role of intelligence too, because. You know, um, Putin lined up 160,000 soldiers. Usually when you're invading a country, you want to have at least a three to one margin of your soldiers versus their soldiers. But Putin lined up 0.8 soldiers to Ukrainian soldiers. Did he think he could just take it easy? Do you think that's it? I think he just figured that. I think he figured he was going to roll in. He was going to that that the Ukrainians were going to greet him as a savior because it was a Nazi government that he was over overtaking. Oh, right. Nazi. Uh, the Jewish and, Nazi. I forgot yeah, about the that. Jewish Nazi. Yeah, exactly. 
And, uh, and so therefore he didn't need a lot of troops because, uh, it was going to, he was going to mop it up in, in 48 hours. I, I, I honestly think that's what he believed. And that was that, you know, you talk, you talked about Putin because his strategy has been take a little bit here, take a little bit there, Crimea, Donbass, uh, South Ossetia, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but here he took a, you know, he took a functioning country of 44 million people and decided to tr- impose his will on that and that has so far been a huge mistake that he has made mm-hmm. because they're not they're not ever going to uh willingly come under the soviet rule again so a uh, russian rule so uh i think that uh, he did he putin did miscalculate and he's already fired a couple of generals he's already fired a couple of security personnel from the uh, fsb which is the uh, successor to the kgb uh, and one has different to, acronym, same yes, yeah. yeah, same, different acronym, same, same yeah. modus operandi. Uh, so, uh, one has to assume that he was not happy with the advice he got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very think, interesting. Yeah. You, you, you look at a, like a guy like that and you look at what he's accomplished and then, and then you also get a little bit because it 15 years ago is a long time to be throwing out your, your manifesto. And that's what he did 15 years ago. He did it. And then over 15 years, he's proven it with action A, B, C, all the way to this. And I don't think, look, I don't think a lot of people could have even picked Ukraine out on a map before this. But what's, I mean, outside of the president of Ukraine being as charismatic and impressive as he's been, and I don't just mean the fake charismatic. I mean, the guys on the ground with a whatever kind of weapon in his hand. Um, I, I think the fortitude of Ukrainian people has just knocked everybody on. You know what I mean? Like just everybody is just dumbstruck. And I'm assuming he just feels the same way. I'm assuming, you know, you see pictures of that, you know, that picture of the, like the 65 year old woman learning how to shoot. Yeah. Yeah. It it puts everything in perspective. In in a sense, it does put everything in perspective because uh, our generations for a while now haven't been used to that kind of existential threat. And here, here's a country that faces an existential Mm -hmm. threat and they're willing to fight for it and they're willing to die for it. And they're willing to, for their sons and daughters to die for it. And we're just not used to that. Uh, and, mm-hmm. You know, I'm not saying we're a soft society or anything, but uh, yeah. it's just a different, uh, a different level of intensity. Let's put it yeah, that way. Absolutely. Uh, so but how it's, do you it's reality. Think yeah. How do you we're, first, like, you think stalemate, we're just going to sit like this for a while. And then what? Because I really think if he doesn't lose the land he's taken, it's just going to be a matter of time before we're right back here. Yeah, I mean, a lot depends on what happens in Kiev. Uh, you know, uh, if if he f- continues to fail to encircle it and strangle it out of existence, um, he's he's going to have a he's going to have a problem. Uh, his supply lines are poor. Uh, now I, we have to be careful because I, I believe. Look, both sides are doing propaganda right now. Let's 100%. not be naive yes. about it. The Ukrainians are. are are masters in social media terms of their propaganda uh, and the Russians have their propaganda. But, you know, we had at the beginning of the war, this ghost jet of Ukraine that was taking down uh, Russian jets. Remember that? And it was just like complete fiction, it's a right? secret jet. Yeah. 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 You know, so we just have to be careful. But uh, I think most military experts that I've been listening to have indicated that uh, that Putin does have a problem with logistics and supply, uh, and uh, getting uh, that it's it's difficult for him to do more than he's doing, which explains his current tactic, which is to bomb the crap out of urban centers because they they can't get their troops in there without a whole lot of them dying, uh, and so that explains that. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, he's trying to get a land bridge to Crimea. He still hasn't even a month in. He hasn't even accomplished that, let yeah. alone anything, any other one of his major objectives. So right now, uh, unless I'm missing something, uh, he's he's had a big fat failure on his hands. The other interesting thing is, of course, you know, uh, this all happened 
with the overlay of the of the Beijing Olympics because oh, Putin yeah. and Xi Jinping met at the Olympics just as the Olympics were starting. And mm-hmm. they, they created their fr- friendship treaty, you know, BFFs to the end treaty. And uh, but uh, Xi says to Putin, look, if you're going to invade Ukraine, wait till after the Olympics. Can you please? He said, yeah, sure, sure. I'll wait till a day after the Olympics, which is what he did again. Same as the Sochi Olympics in Crimea. Yeah. He does yeah. the same deal again. People were asking me, when do you think Putin's going to invade? I said, the day after the Olympics. Yeah, Duh. Sure. Uh, that's what he did last time. Anyway, so he, he does that a day after the Olympics. I'm sure he assured the president of China that it was he's going to mop it up in 48 to 72 hours. Mm, yeah, and of so China, did. their number one strategic and military ally in the world right now, is a complete mess up when it comes to invading a country successfully. So if I were China, I'd not be very happy right now. Yeah, I'd be about, and that's and here's and here's the the piece on the board that everybody talks about, right? What is China going to do? And I'm thinking nothing. China's China's not going to step outside of China. I, people's mentality surrounding China, they can ally themselves with whoever they want to ally themselves. Whoever's going to serve their you know their foreign policy at that time in that region. But let's be, they're not an expansionist state. <laughs> well, except for is Taiwan, it, but yes, well, yeah. But that's, I mean, well, we, we can go back to that, but they're, but they still haven't invaded. No, no. China could have taken Taiwan in about 37 seconds, or they could have blown it out the ocean, but they haven't. And they haven't because at the, even when it comes to land, they deem theirs. Now, granted, Tibet, different story. But even when it comes to land, they claim is theirs. They, they don't step out militarily. They're not that kind of expansionist state. So I can see them not wanting to take a side. I can see them saying, you do you, we're going to. But for people who think they're actually going to step in militarily and side with Russia, how likely do you think that is? Yeah, I don't think very likely. I think uh, Biden had a call with uh, President Xi uh, just uh, earlier, a few days ago, and uh, he laid down a red line saying, look, uh, we know you're an ally of Russia, but the minute you start funneling arms and and other items to, to the conflict, that's uh, you. we will treat you as a combatant is basically what he said to China. So I think uh, the readout I got on that, it's actually quite hilarious, the readout, because the, the readout is what, what both sides say the conversation was about. So the readout on the U.S. side was we, we, we told the Chinese they really can't do a lot of support for Russia, otherwise we, we would con- treat them as another ally combatant. And the Chinese readout was uh, all allegorical. Is that the right word? It was, uh, it was all metaphor. It was fascinating. It was, uh, you know, it takes two hands to clap was one of the metaphors they used. Uh, and another one was, uh, when you, when you put the bread in the toaster, both sides get burnt. It's like, what the hell, you know, you know, anyway, I think their point was, you got yourself into this mess. We're not going to get you out of it, but we're not going to help the other guys get we're out of it either. There you yeah. go. I, I think that's and, what I got out of it. I think that's their genuine foreign policy plan in, in yeah. most situations. Um, so what would you be watching for? I know I've taken up a lot of your time once again, but what would you be watching for like in the, in the coming days? Or is there any, any big things that you anticipate happening or? Yeah, Biden's going to be in Poland. Yeah. Biden's going to be in Poland the end of the week. That'll be interesting uh, to see uh, what his language is there. Right. Uh, and uh, I, uh, again, I think there's a lot happening that we don't know about, Joanna. Always I'll be like honest it. with you, uh, in terms of arms and other types of support for Ukraine. Um, and so I think that that will continue. The vote in the U.S. Congress to strip Russia of its uh, most perf- most favored nation status was uh it was 400 to eight or something lot. like that yeah. yeah there was only eight members of congress of who voted against those, it those eight are real winners by the way yeah yeah i know i know uh but i think that you're seeing uh, there's a couple of things that are very interesting uh let, let's forget about russia per se right now so in the u.s 
there really is a reconnection of the two political parties uh, having a bipartisan consensus now, both on China and Russia. Okay. Mm -hmm. 98% of the Republican Party is anti Putin, and 100% of the Democratic Party is anti Putin. So that's pretty Amazing. good. That's More pretty good. More unified. Yes, absolutely. More unified. Yeah. Even his orangeness, Donald Trump. Is, is now saying, well, that's not the Putin I knew. Something has changed. He's gone off his rocker because he right. knows the Republican Party is anti-Putin and he can't be seen too close to Putin. So Absolutely that, not. So that, that's very interesting. So there is a bipartisan consensus there. The other thing that, uh, that Putin has done is he has united Europe mm -hmm. more so than in the last 40 years. Right. And, and uh, you know, it took a particular kind of, maniacal genius of Putin to do that because, you know, Europe is not being known as very united, but now they're dis disentangling themselves from the oil and gas of, of Russia, other uh, investments. Uh, it's happening very, very quickly. They're kicking out the oligarchs. They're confiscating their yachts uh, and their property in London grad, which is what London is called. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, because there's like, I think there's $2 trillion of oligarch money, money in London. There England. it is. And, and that goes back to our original yeah. conversation. Where's yeah, the yeah, money? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they got that. yeah, no. So the, the, all of that is at risk. And uh, maybe the oligarchs will talk to the generals and maybe that'll be the end of Putin someday. Who knows? But uh, hope hope is not a strategy. I, I keep saying that to myself. Just because I hope Putin's gone doesn't mean we have a strategy <laughs> to get rid of Putin. But okay. in any event, uh, so Europe is united more so than it's ever been. Can you like... Uh, the UK left Europe a few years ago. Right. Can you envision any other country leaving Europe right now? No, no. there's no, there's yeah. no way. Uh, no, even the anti-European forces like Macron in France, where he has an election next month, uh, people were worried: is he gonna is he gonna lose? He's yeah. gonna win hands down. All the yeah. anti the, the forces of the right wing populism that he faced are crushed right now. Because they were too close to Putin, yeah. And uh, the same with uh, alternative for Deutschland and in Germany, they're crushed. It really has crushed um, right wing extreme populism in Europe. This whole thing, uh, which is very very interesting. Uh, it is, and, it is, and, yeah. And I'd, many would say a welcome development. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it. Uh, Putin hasn't changed Ukraine, but he sure has changed Europe and the United States right now, for sure. <laughs> Which I wonder if he's sitting at home right now going, damn it. Like, he obviously gets all of those implications. He's not a mort. He gets all of that. And I don't see a, a channel. I don't see a way for him to get around it anymore. I mean, it is what it is. And that's why I do think it's a maybe not a high probability, but a definite legitimate probability that the people in Russia that are higher up, that have the money, that back him, are going to get to a point where we're like, no, now, now you have to be done because if because if you're not, if you're done, then maybe we can salvage our money, our connections, our power that we used to have that you've obliterated if you're gone. So, I mean, I, I don't think that's necessarily just hopeful. I think that solid strategy, if I was sitting just behind him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and that that to me is is a reasonable thing to say. It, it will take time. Uh, the protests in Russia aren't enough to do it. The, uh, the, the media protests aren't enough to do it. Uh, the WhatsApp groups aren't enough to do it, but uh, it could be a combination of things, but, and, and it needs opportunity. Of course, you see in the meetings, uh, that Putin has had where he's 40 feet away from anybody else in the, in the meeting room. Did you, uh, my favorite meme of this entire thing, my favorite thing was when he was giving whatever kind of press conference and it was clear he wasn't there because his hand went through the microphone. Do you yeah. know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the next time Zelensky was on, was on film, this smart, charismatic little bugger just decided, yeah. he didn't even say anything, he just moved the microphone yeah, and moved yeah. it back. Yeah, And I'm yeah, like, yeah. Ah, yeah, you should smart. be like, so smart, so, so smart.
Yeah, no, lots um, of lots of interesting stuff going on there, and yeah, it is the first meme war. Obviously, uh, people it really uh, is, and, I, and I've done it too. I put the Ukrainian flag on my uh, social media uh, avatar and and whatnot. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it just, uh, uh, you know, uh, it just goes to show. I, I was at, you know, when McDonald's closed uh, their shop in um, right. in uh, in Russia. It just reminded me because when I, when I was in Russia, it was still part of the USSR. Yeah. And I, I was at uh, the McDonald's. There was only one McDonald's in all of the USSR. And I it was in Pushkin Square. It was run by a Canadian, by the way. Canadians ran the McDonald's restaurant in, in, in Moscow. And I went there uh, as a young business person, lawyer, and uh, had my Bolshoi Mac and talk to these Russians about hockey because that was something we had in common. And right. it was just, it really was, there was one McDonald's, there was one Baskin Robbins, and there was one Pizza Hut in all of Moscow and all, all of Russia. Right. Uh, and uh, I just remember it as a time of great hope and promise that uh, maybe Russia could be part of civilization and society the way I defined it, I suppose, but at right. least have, you know, uh, a place for their, citizens to to debate and to uh to electioneer and to yeah. be part of a rule of law state that had democratic elections and uh mm -hmm. of course uh, that has all been blown to smithereens uh unfortunately but uh it did remind me of an, my time there and uh i i have a love for the russian people uh, i don't i obviously hate their leader right. uh, well, but sure. uh, yeah, but I, uh, but the people, they're, they're long suffering people and you can say, well, they have, you know, they have only themselves to blame, but you know, not all of them have themselves I, to blame. They're, they're just trying to survive. And, and when I see the protests and I see the footage coming out of Russia and I know what those people are risking by protesting yeah. there and what they will face or what they could, and very, very real probability of facing I find that incredibly brave, incredibly powerful. And it should be, you know, the more that we that we should embrace that and magnify that as being, you know, heroes in their own right. You know, right. there there have been soldiers that have put down their weapons. There have been so many opportunities where they know what going home to Putin looks like and they're doing it anyways. And that I mean, I don't know a lot of a lot of soldiers and a lot of people do that when their government is doing the wrong thing, but they are that powerful. Well, they uh, think of the cosmonauts of the International Space Station who had the uh, Ukrainian jumpsuits on. I mean, they're up there for the next six months. They better hope something changes by the time they have to go back. <laughs> or they'll just stay. We're just going to wait here just for <laughs> right. a little longer. Exactly. You guys sort it out. We'll see it from up here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, again, talking about such important things and giving, you know, all of your years of experience and, and impressive intellect to the subject matter. No, I really of course. appreciate it. No, it's my honor. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you so much. And again, this was the Honorable Tony Clement. I will put all of his links in the bio so you can go check out his amazing podcast and all of your social media. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. I'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat station. Dismissed.